Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to our Thursday evening live stream Bible study, looking at Paul's letter to the Philippians. We're certainly uh, very thankful to have you joining us tonight, whether you're watching the live stream or whether you're watching a recording of it later, either on our Facebook page or on our YouTube channel. It's a privilege to have the opportunity to study God's Word with you. We certainly pray that it will be a blessing to you as it is to us. Kind of the, the plan for this evening is we want to spend just a moment reviewing the introduction to the letter that we looked at last week, the circumstances that led to the establishment and then the writing of this letter. And then we want to finish the lesson that we began last time. We're going to be picking up today in Philippians chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. Uh, if, uh, if you are looking at our Facebook feed, there is a link to this lesson. It's really the same lesson that we looked at last Thursday. So if you still have yours from last Thursday, this handout is no different. But in case you needed uh, a new copy of it, there's a link in the Facebook page for it. Again, it's going to cover the introduction to Philippians through chapter 1, verse 11. Um, so we're going to be picking up today after a brief introduction with verse 3. But let's begin our study with, with prayer. So we pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we know that without your sending your spirit, the scriptures will remain a closed book to us, that we will never be able to see the glory of the gospel through the eyes of faith. Therefore, we ask that according to your promise, you would send the counselor to remind us of all the things that you have said, that through him you would open our eyes to the wonderful things that are written in your word, that you would give us many opportunities to apply these words to our lives, and that in everything that we think and say and do, we might glorify the Savior who has bought us by his blood. It is in his name that we ask this in all things. Amen. Okay, so just a real brief uh, overview of what we looked at last week. We talked about in pretty good detail the circumstances surrounding the establishment of the church at Philippi. On Paul's second missionary journey, uh, he wanted to go into the area of Mysia and Bithynia, but the Spirit of the Lord wouldn't let him. And he has this dream or vision at night of a Macedonian man saying, come and help us. So he and his traveling companions um, crossed the Aegean Sea into um, Europe for the very first time, the European mainland. And the first village or the first city that they get to is the city of Philippi, uh, where he meets three very important people. He meets Lydia, the dealer in purple dyes, who a uh, wealthy woman who single-handedly funds Paul's ministry in Philippi and probably even beyond his ministry in Philippi. There's the slave girl who is possessed by a demon um, that Paul uh, exorcises that demon and that causes her owners to be upset with him and, and uh, they have Paul and Silas arrested <clears throat> and thrown in prison. And that gives them the opportunity to minister to the jailer at Philippi, who's kind of the third and uh, final really important figure in the establishment of the city. So those are the circumstances, kind of the unique, special circumstances surrounding the establishment of the church at Philippi. Um, where, when, the, uh, when this letter was written, though, the letter was written uh, at the end of Paul's third missionary journey, um, the missionary journey ended with what we call Paul's first Roman imprisonment, where the Apostle Paul was uh, imprisoned, waiting to have his case heard by Caesar um, after being falsely accused of sowing sedition in the Roman Empire. So he is under house arrest in Rome. Uh, he's chained to a Roman guard 24 hours a day, seven days a week, under house arrest. And... He pens four letters, what we call the prison epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And they all have a lot of language in common. You can tell they were written about the same time. Uh, Philippians, <clears throat> though, is a, is a little unique in that it is a thank, really it is a thank you letter. It's really the Apostle Paul's way of writing and thanking the Philippians for having sent him a gift of money to help support himself during his Roman imprisonment. So those are the circumstances under which the, the, the epistle was written. And that makes it ironic or it makes it powerful. It makes, us, it, makes it, um, 
remarkable that Paul would write this epistle which the main theme of which is joy or rejoicing that even in the midst of his uh, in the midst of his captivity really his imprisonment he's still um, talking about being able to rejoice in the Lord because of all that is going on uh, through God's word even in the midst of his imprisonment last time we looked at the very first the first two verses the introduction to the letter where Paul addresses the saints at Philippi we had the opportunity to remind ourselves that unlike the Roman Catholic doctrine of the saints which refers to a very small class of people who lived extraordinarily holy lives that when the Bible uses the word saint or holy one it refers to those who are holy through faith in Jesus it really is nothing other than a a synonym <coughs> for a believer um, because because believers are declared not guilty through faith in Jesus they are in God's eyes holy so when he writes to the holy ones in Philippi he's not writing to a special group within the church at Philippi who's especially sanctified but he's writing to all believers in Philippi and in that sense of course there's much in his letter that applies to all believers even today and throughout the centuries <coughs> And then we also uh, noticed this uh, common Pauline um, greeting that uh, is in most of his epistles, grace and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We emphasize the relationship between grace and peace. The relationship is that grace, God's undeserved love, is the cause of peace, the, the ending of hostility between man and God. <clears throat> that because of God's grace the effect or the result is that we have peace with God so the relationship between grace and peace is one of cause and effect because of God's grace the cause of our peace is God's grace or <clears throat> the result of God's grace is our peace with God and now what we want to do is jump into beginning of verse 3 it's very common for in Paul's epistles for uh, it the greeting to be immediately followed by a thanksgiving and that's what we have going on here in Philippians we want to read Philippians chapter 1 verses 3 to 6 <clears throat> I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now being confident of this that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus and now that I've read these verses I think we did talk a little bit about um, verses 3 and 4 this idea of when Paul remembers the Philippians or when he gives thanks to God for the Philippians what comes to his mind is their partnership in the gospel the fact that they have joined with him um, in this this great project of gospel proclamation uh, and of course the way that they did that was at least at first um, it was monetarily it was the way that they supported Paul in his missionary journey we're also going to hear later in the letter that they sent a member of their congregation to go work with Paul um, that they are actually sending out missionaries along with Paul to work with Paul during his missionary journey so this when Paul thinks about the Philippian congregation he thinks about partners in the gospel and we just took that time to remember that really nothing has changed in these thousands of years that none of us can do gospel ministry alone that God wants us to partner with people to do things together what we could never do alone or even as we could never do as a Christian congregation um, that's why we come together as a church body like a synod so um, <clears throat> that first question number eight the reason for Paul's joy is he remembers the Philippians and his prayers is for their partnership in the gospel then in verse 6 we have this very interesting statement where Paul says that he is as he prays or as he gives thanks to the flip for the Philippians he has confidence of this and that this looks forward so this is what he has confidence in that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus now I know that the subject of this work is not specifically um, indicated all we have is the uh, the subject is he who began a good work 
this is a good example of what we call it's not exactly a divine passive but it's it's something like a divine passive where the object where the subject is so obvious that it's not listed the subject is God God began a good work in the Philippians and God will carry that good work on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus so we have to really wrestle with three different things if if God is the subject of this clause which he is excuse me God is the subject of the clause then what is the good work that he began in them what does it mean to carry that work to its completion and what is the day of Christ Jesus those are really the three big questions you have to wrestle with in verse 6 and um, the first question in there at least I have I have on on the lesson um, what is the good work that God began in them well really it's the good work of faith the good work of what we might call conversion um, the letter to the Philippians includes this powerful reminder that we do not bring ourselves to faith. Luther very famously captures this truth in his explanation of the third article of the Creed when he says that I believe that I cannot by my own thinking or choosing believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. And that idea, that doctrine is drawn from among many passages. We could draw it from Philippians 1 verse 6 that we don't bring ourselves to faith. We don't do the good work of bringing ourselves to faith. The good work of being brought to faith is exactly that. It's passive, being brought to faith. We, we have no part to play in it. Um, when we come to faith, it is entirely and only because of God's work in the gospel. We are 100% passive. Of course, that isn't the case in sanctification, and we're going to have the opportunity to talk about that at the end of this paragraph, at the end of this section. Um, but for now, the good work that, that Paul has in mind is justification, how we get right with God, how we are declared not guilty in God's sight. And that's done entirely and only by Jesus and through Jesus um, so that we are entirely passive in our coming to faith. We cannot, by our own thinking or choosing, believe in Jesus Christ our Lord or come to him. Only the Holy Spirit calling me through the gospel can do that. So that's the good work that God has begun, the good work of faith or conversion. But what I think is especially beautiful is that the Apostle Paul prays that the very same God who brought us to faith is the God who will bring our faith to its completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So let's jump to that third question. What is the day of Christ Jesus? That is a, a way of talking about the last day, our judgment day, the day of Jesus' return, the day when Jesus comes back to judge the living and the dead, um, the, the, the end of this present evil age and the beginning of the eternal age to come. That's what the day of Christ Jesus is. In other words, it's kind of the the end or the goal of Christian faith is to get to the day of Christ Jesus. Um, and so uh, what the Apostle Paul is saying here is that not only is, is it God's work to bring us to faith, but it's also God's work to keep us in that one true saving faith until the coming, until the day of Christ Jesus, until the last day. That God not only is the one who brings us to faith, but he's also the one who keeps us in the faith. And, um, or that idea, bring our faith to its completion, right? Um, so, and then, so I have the question number 10. Why is it so comforting to know that we can have the same confidence today? What I mean by that is, just as we know that God created the good work of our faith in us, we were totally passive in that so too we can also be confident that he will bring that good work or bring us the faith to completion until the last day, until the day of Jesus Christ our Lord. And that is tremendously comforting because if keeping my faith were up to me, if, if, it, were, if it were my responsibility to keep my faith, then I would ruin it. I would find a way to lose it. Right? Um, if my salvation in any way depends on me, then that opens the door to me being able to ruin my salvation and, and the inevitability of doing so because I am a fallen, sinful creature. Right? 
So what God reminds us is that not only, he says, dear child, not only am I the one who brought you to faith, but I'm also the one who keeps you in the faith. I'm also the one who guards and protects your faith. Um, I think, for example, about Jesus' words in John's gospel, when he talks about um, holding believers in the palm of his hand so that no one can snatch them out of his hand. Or if you want to think of a parallel passage from Paul's letters, you can think about Romans chapter 8, that there's nothing in all creation that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the very same power that was at work to keep us in the faith, sorry, that bring us to the faith, is the power that keeps us in the faith. Now, there will be at this point, or there should be, a kind of question or objection in your mind. Because this doctrine has been abused. It is abused. Um, and, a, and a teaching, a very common teaching in American evangelicalism called Once Saved, Always Saved. And it's, it takes this, um, this teaching that it is the very same God who brings us to faith that keeps us in the faith. And it takes it to a level that goes beyond what scripture says. So basically what Once Saved, Always Saved says is, if God is really the one who keeps us in the faith, then once a person has come to faith, it's impossible for them to lose their faith. Okay, um, so that's kind of the argument that, that they go, they, you, they might appeal to a verse like Philippians 1, 6 and say, um, here's, here's the proof for once saved, always saved, but just like God brought us to faith, God keeps us in the faith. It's true that the very same God who brings us to faith keeps us in the faith. But there's another line of scripture, there's another teaching of scripture that we have to be cognizant of, which is that it is possible for us to lose our faith. It's possible for a person to lose their faith. We have examples of that in the Bible. Um, the first one that comes to mind is Judas. Um, I really do believe that at one time Judas was a believer, and I don't think that Judas had a long three-year master plan to get 30 pieces of silver for betraying Jesus, that at least one time Judas really was a believer. Um, but we know that he dies in despair. The apostle, um, um, the King Saul, the first king of Israel, King Saul is another man. I, I can't imagine that God would, would make the first king of Israel an unbeliever, would choose an unbeliever to be the first king of Israel. And yet we know that at the end of his life, Saul despairs and commits suicide. And then we have um, two people mentioned in the um, pastoral epistles named Hymenaeus and Alexander um, and Paul says that they shipwreck their faith and I've always made the argument that if you if you shipwreck your faith that means you had to have faith you can't shipwreck something that you never had so the question might be for us as Lutherans is how do we balance this how do we where do we find the narrow Lutheran middle road between on the one hand respecting what the, the Bible says about God's work of keeping us in the faith, and yet, on the other hand, respecting what God's word says about the ability of human beings to lose their faith. How do we balance those two things? And I'd say a couple of things. The first thing I'd say is, really, that question is nothing other than the tension between law and gospel, right? Um, the fact that we can lose our faith, the warning in Scripture that it is possible for you to lose your faith, that is 100% a message of the law. God comes and says, you better remember that you can lose your faith, um, that, that if, you, if you think that you can do this on your own, you're not going to be able to. That's a message of the law. The whole purpose of the law is to show us our own inadequacy to show us that we cannot uh, keep our faith in and of ourselves. It, it reveals our total dependence on God. And when it comes to keeping our faith, not just coming to faith, but keeping our faith, we need that message of the law too, or else we would we would kind of drift off into this once saved, always saved. Well, you know, I, I came to faith at least one time, so it doesn't matter if I and reading my Bible. It doesn't matter if I'm doing devotions. It doesn't matter if I'm studying God's Word. It doesn't matter if I come to worship, because once saved, always saved, okay? So, so the message of the law, that it is possible for us to lose our faith, is there to remind us, or is there to, to do battle against pride. Um, and that's really what the Apostle Paul talks about when he says, if you are standing firm, then be careful 
um, because it's the one who thinks they're standing firm that's about to fall, right? Um, So on the one hand, we hear the message of God's law. It is possible to lose your faith, lest we become proud. But this verse in Philippians 1.6, this is pure gospel, where God says and comes, Dear Christian, um, I know that you're afraid of losing your faith. I know that when you look at yourself and you look at this truth that it is possible for you to lose your faith, that you wonder, how is it possible that I'm not going to lose my faith as someone who is weak and as sinful as I am? And he says, Dear child of, of mine, remember that it is not up to you to stay in the faith. That it is, up, it is up to me. The very same gospel that brought you to faith is the gospel that keeps you in the faith. Um, so that's the first thing I have to say. is this, It's really the, the tension between once saved, always saved, and the fact that we can fall away from our faith. The tension between the Bible saying that God brings the good work of faith to completion, along with what the Bible says about the possibility of losing faith. That tension is really nothing other than a tension between law and gospel. Okay? And there is no reconciling that tension. We just let both of the messages apply to us all the time. If you regularly watch on Sunday night, um, our Sunday night Bible class, you know that I've used this analogy before that the law, God's law and gospel are like a pair of, of glasses. Um, like these glasses that I'm wearing here, except, well, actually my glasses too. Um, each lens has a different prescription. So, um, in order to get the full view of what God says to us, you have to have both lenses. But there's a gospel lens and there's a law lens. And when we look at God or when God looks at us through the law lens, um, he, he, it, it's as if there is no gospel. And if that were the case, then we would lose our faith. But when God looks at us or when we look at God through the gospel lens, it's like there's no law. The, but we never, we are never in a situation where God only looks at us through law or gospel. He's always looking at us through both. Um, he, we always have the entire set of glasses on. And so um, it, we, the message of the law and the message of the gospel always apply to us all the time. Okay? So that's what I mean by just letting that tension stand. But here's more of the practical question. Okay, less, less doctrinal, less kind of theoretical, but let's talk more practical. How does this play out in a believer's life? Well, it is. we know that the Bible says that it is God's responsibility to keep us in the faith. We also know that the Bible says that the way that God keeps us in the faith is through hearing the gospel. We hear that in Romans chapter 10, right? Faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word about Christ. So it's not a mystery. It's not. It's not magic. How God keeps us in the faith. How God. Keep, um, how God preserves our faith until the day of Christ Jesus. He tells us exactly how He does it. There's only one way He's promised that He does it, and that is through the gospel and word and sacrament. And so we as Christians, since we know it is possible for us to lose our faith. And since we know that it is only through the gospel and word and sacrament that God strengthens and keeps faith, we as Christians will faithfully make use of the gospel and word and sacrament. Not because it's our faithful use that keeps us in the faith. And if that were the case, then it would be us, it would be up to us to keep ourselves in the faith. But by making faithful use of the word and word and sacrament, the gospel and word and sacrament, we let the word and the sacrament do what the word and sacrament do, which is keep us in the one true Christian faith. And this is why it's so important for us to be doing exactly what we're doing right now, exactly what we're doing as a, what so much of what we do as a congregation is all about, is is growing in our faith. Um, the church is not just about bringing people to faith. That certainly is one of the purposes of the church. Jesus says, therefore, go and make disciples. Um, He wants us to go find people who are lost and and through the proclamation of the gospel, have them be found. He wants us to, to find people who are blind so that through the proclamation of the gospel, they might see. So part of the reason for the church is to make new disciples. But an equally important part of the church is to grow the disciples it already has. 
So just think about that great commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations by baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and by teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That's really a huge part of what our congregation is all about. It's about teaching people who already know the gospel, the gospel, that they might know it better. Because that is the means by which God preserves us in the one true Christian faith. Right? So the great comfort, uh, I'd say um, this verse, uh, Philippians 1 verse 6, I think has, is, is, a, it has, is at the same time a, an incredibly comforting verse. It reminds us that it's not like God brings us to faith and then says, all right, kid, now you're on your own. I hope, sure hope you don't lose your faith. Um, that's not how it is. God promises the very same one who brought us to faith is the one who keeps us in the faith. We can be confident of that. And yet, on the other hand, the verse reminds us of how important it is, the practical application of how important it is to be growing in our faith, to, to be reading our Bibles at home, to be having devotional time, whether maybe that's reading meditations, or maybe you have a devotional book at home that you read from, or attending a Bible study. This is one of the reasons why we wanted to make Bible studies available online. Uh, it's why we started our Sunday night live streaming Bible study three years ago, um, because we want to make it as easy as possible for people to be in God's Word and be growing in the Word. It's why in these unprecedented times of, you know, safer at home edicts, why we're streaming all of our midweek Bible studies, uh, because we want to make sure that people have multiple opportunities to grow in their faith, because that is the way that God keeps us in the one true saving faith. All right, so tremendously beautiful passage, tremendously comforting passage, um, but also I think a very practical passage in that it reminds us of how important it is to be growing in our faith. Okay, so that will end that little paragraph, verses one to, uh, 3 to 6. Uh, Rachel will let me know if there are any questions that come in, but this would be a good, a good point or a good breaking point for if you do have a question about anything that we just talked about, um, that would be a good time to bring that up. Um, and I'm losing all of my stuff. Uh, All right, but with that being said, let's go ahead and continue to push on um, into the next part of the letter, which is uh, verses 7 and 8. And Paul says, It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you, with the affection of Christ Jesus. Do you need to open it up there? Yeah, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, so my, my wife is going to help me find my lesson again. Um, what we want to be emphasizing here, though, is um, the Apostle Paul feels, or the Apostle Paul is reminding the Philippians that he that he feels this connection to him, this special connection to them, because. Um, because of their partnership in the gospel. Um, and I, as I look at my lesson, I see we're going to go beyond verse 8. We're going to go all the way to the end of the section. So let's read verses 9 to 11 too. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Again, that's another way of talking about the last day okay so being found pure and blameless for the last day filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through jesus christ to the glory and praise of god so the first question i have on here um it, it's very interesting because of course in verse 7 the apostle paul says it is right for me to feel this way about all of you um christian love is is a feeling Okay. Love is a feeling. It's something that touches our emotions. However, Christian love is not merely a feeling. It's not just a warm, fuzzy feeling. Because the reality is, is that we don't always have the warm, fuzzy feeling for each other. Um, in fact, many times we have exact opposite kind of feelings for each other. So Christian love 
is going to have to be something more than just warm, fuzzy feelings. And that's where I think verse 9 comes in. Um, so in verse 9, Paul says, this is my prayer, that your love, so you can, I think you could be that love, your love for God, could be your love for the apostle, and it could be your love for one another. I don't know that any you can I, you can narrow it down to any one of those three. It's probably you can say this is true about all three of them, right? But the apostle says, "I want that love to abound more and more, not in warm fuzzy feelings, right? And but the way that we get that Christian love to abound more and more is through knowledge and depth of insight." So number 11 on your sheet, according to chapter 1, verse 9, what must Christian love be based upon? Well, it must be based upon knowledge and depth of insight of the scriptures. Right? So Christian love is not based on our just kind of decision to love each other. It's not separated from the scriptures. It's based on the scriptures. Now you might say, well, why even bring this up? Well, there are people out there um, who will say something like this. It's foolish for Christians to argue about doctrinal differences because all Jesus wants us to do is love each other. Okay, so we shouldn't, we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't have debates with Roman Catholics about how a person is saved. We shouldn't separate from the Reformed who believe in once saved, always saved. That we shouldn't separate from the Missouri Synod because we, um, because we don't agree about what God's word it says about fellowship, that knowledge and depth of insight about the scriptures doesn't matter. We should just throw all that away because all that matters is that we love each other. And this is a, a verse, this is a passage that specifically speaks against that. Um, in, in, in reality, God says he wants Christian love not to be based despite difference in doctrine. But he wants Christian love to be based on unity of doctrine, right? And so the way that we build Christian love among each other is not by minimizing or ignoring doctrinal differences, but it's by working through them. It's by growing in our knowledge and understanding of the word so that we can all be on the same page about what that word says. And when we're on the same page about the word, what the word says, then, then we're in a position where we can show real Christian love to one another. We can do what is in the best interest of the other person, regardless of the cost to the one that does it. So uh, I think just a powerful reminder to us, don't fall into the trap of that false teaching, um, that kind of false idea um, to, you know, quote the Beatles, that all you need is love or, you know, love is all you need. Um, Christian love is based off of true teaching, of doctrine. And that's why Christians, have, uh, as Lutherans especially, have always been so focused on true doctrine. It really is the basis of Christian love. Now what's interesting is, if you look at number 12, what results does the apostle expect to see when the Philippians' love abounds more and more in knowledge and depth of insight? Well, that's the, the results that he expects is introduced by the word, so that. Um, so here are the results that I expect in verse 10. So that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. So again, here's, a, here's one of the really interesting things that happens as we grow in our faith, as we become more mature Christians, as we grow in our knowledge and depth of insight of the scriptures, is that we learn to discern the will of God. And we discern what is right from what is wrong. One of the ways that you can talk about the maturity of faith is discerning and behaving, you know, following according to um, what is, uh, what goes, or what is in accordance with God's will instead of what's going against God's will. So it's, it's important not only that we know what God's will is, obviously you can't do God's will if you don't know what it is, but then there's also the power to do what God's will is, and that comes from growing on our faith too. So in other words, what I'd, what I'd say to this, what I'd say uh, in res that the Apostle Paul's um, expectation, the result that he expects of growing in, our, in, the in the Philippians' faith 
is he expects them to have a more mature Christian faith. Right? He expects that as they study the word in depth, they will live the word in depth. Again, but there is a there's a crucial connection between those two. You can't have one without the other. You can't live a better Christian life apart from having better understanding of the word. And having a better understanding of God's word means diddly squat if you don't follow it up with living a more Christian life, a more mature Christian life. The two are inextricably linked together. Um, Rachel. I know that we're probably not supposed to flip ahead in the book of Philippians yet, yeah. but I just can't help but think how parallel this is to like in chapter 4, whatever is, when it talks about whatever we should think about. Yeah. And I never really had connected those before. Uh, so Rachel's, uh, Rachel is jumping ahead to chapter 4 when it, um, the Apostle Paul talks about whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is good. Think about such things. I actually, um, I actually was tempted to write this class instead of talking about joy, um, which really is the theme of Philippians. That's why I ended up doing it. But I think that there's no other book of the New Testament that talks about a Christian's thought life as much as the letter to the Philippians. And I don't know if you've ever thought about that. You've ever thought about the fact that you have a thought life, right? I think we, we think a lot about the life that, of, that we do, the things that we do. We kind of call that our life. You know, some, somebody somebody ever says, well, you guys never go anywhere. You just stay at home every night. You don't have a life. Um, well, that's, you know, just, say, this is just saying you don't do very much. So I, I think we think about, uh, when we think about our life, we think about doing. And I think it's very common for us to think about our life in the terms of what we feel, our, our, our emotional life, our emotional well-being. But I don't think there's any book of the New Testament that is that talks more are more directly about what a Christian thinks than does the letter to the Philippians. Now, when we get to chapter 4, it gets really explicit, where he's going to actually tell us, think about these things. Okay, um, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is good. But you already see that emphasis here in chapter 1, um, where, the, where the apostle is already getting us to think about how the, the center and core of our faith is not a feeling and it isn't even a doing, right? It's a knowing. Um, the, the Christian, um, Luther, Luther very famously once said that the, the Christian, the, the only Christian organ is the ear. That, that that's really what the Christian is all about. It's about hearing the word of God, about understanding and meditating on the word of God. Um, and um, it's, and so I think it's a very good point that that we're gonna we're, you're gonna continue to see this as we as we read the letter to be thinking about what does this letter teach us about what it means to think like a Christian. I don't know if there's any book of the New Testament or any book of the Bible even that talks about a Christian's thought life more than Philippians. Okay. Um, Chapter or number 13, and in chapter 1, verse 11, Paul speaks about being filled with the fruit of righteousness. Filled with the fruit of righteousness. Now, that is one of these, what we call of genitive phrases, um, that can be subjective or objective, okay? And uh, you don't need to remember that. Uh, but what you do need to remember is that there are two possible interpretations of verse 11. What is the fruit of righteousness? Is it the fruits of faith that flow from righteousness? Or is it the fruit of faith that is righteousness? In other words, um, when you become a believer, one of the things that you receive is righteousness. So the fruit of, um, there is a fruit that is righteousness, the fruit of faith that is righteousness. We would call that a fruit of justification. Or, are the, is it the fruits of faith, more what's going to be talked about you know, in another letter of the Apostle Paul, the fruits of faith that flow from righteousness? Whenever you have um, this kind of phrase, like the love of God, is that love that God has for us, the love that we have for God. It's the fruit of righteousness, is that 
the fruit that is righteousness or the fruit that flows from righteousness. Whenever you have such a phrase, then PA11 comes into, into play, okay? And if you've never heard that before, um, Tish Strundel made, a very, made me a very fun little plaque um, because I said so many times during Bible class, um, and this, I didn't come up with this, but that a text without its context becomes a pretext for a proof text. Another way of saying that is um, when you have a, a passage of scripture that can mean, that can in and of itself possibly mean multiple things, how do you know which one it is? Well, the answer is context, context, context. It's context that tells you what, it, what the apostle means. Is he, is he talking about the fruit that is faith? The fruit that is righteousness that comes through faith, a justification kind of fruit? Or is he talking about the fruit that flows from righteousness, the fruits of faith? And I think that in the context, um, because the Apostle Paul is talking about what's going to happen as a believer grows in maturity, as they grow in their understanding and depth of knowledge of God's word, I think that it's pretty clear that the, the fruit of faith or righteousness that's being described here are the, the fruits of righteous living that flow from faith. Right? So Paul speaks about being filled with the fruit of righteousness, probably a reference to their sanctification. Okay? But what I think is very interesting is we're talking about our own lives of sanctification, the good works that we produce, um, th that we live out in response to our Christian faith. But look at what he says in verse 11. We're going to be filled with the fruit of righteousness, that righteousness that is the fruits of faith that we live out, and that comes to us through Jesus Christ. <laughs> so you see, even in our sanctification, we are totally dependent upon Jesus. Sanctification flows from justification, or our life of good works flows from the good work of faith. Um, so this kind of goes right back to the law and gospel tension. The law tells you, you must produce the fruits of faith. Fruits of faith are not optional. Without works, faith is dead, James says. That's the law. The gospel reminds us, but remember, that, you, that the, good, the good works of faith don't really come from you. They come from God. See, to, uh, another parallel passage from Paul's letters would be Ephesians chapter 2. Right? And, um, For we are God's craftsmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We really do have to do good works, but every time we do, have, we do a good work, we have to say to ourselves, yep, the only reason I did that good work is because, because God prepared in advance for me to do it. Um, so uh, I think this is this, it's a very powerful teaching um, that even our lives of sanctification, the, the life of good works that we live in response to our faith, even our lives of sanctification are built around our relationship with Jesus. And I have a discussion question coming where we'll come back to this thought, okay? I'm going to come back to this thought. So I'm not going to jump into it now because I don't want to steal my thunder from um, <laughs> qu uh, question number 17. But then my last question about these verses, the, these very last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven words, to the glory and praise of God, um, what is the ultimate goal of a Christian life of everything that we do as Christians? So again, you might think of another apostle parallel passage that whatever you do, do it to the glory of God, right? And that's what's that's really what's being said here. The, the reason that you and I exist is to glorify or magnify God, that we are to be um, the hands of God, that God wants us to be a way of blessing other people, that when people look at us, they see a reflection of God. That's what the image of God is all about. Um, we are to reflect God's character. In fact, when the Bible says that we are to be children of God, that means that we're supposed to have the same characteristics as God. Um, so I just think a, a reminder to us, I think this is a reminder, that the Christian life is a life that is not lived for self. Right? Christian life is not a life lived for oneself. It's a life that's lived for God. Um, again, I go back to the Apostle, um, that it, the, the Apostle Paul, um, that, they, that um, Christ died for all, 
that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who lived, who has died and rose again for them. That's Jesus, right? So the, the entire Christian life is really all God-centered. It's really all about glorifying God in everything we say and do. Um, and you have this kind of tremendous thanksgiving at the beginning of Philippians, which takes us all the way back to how we started to come to faith, who, who, he who began a good work in you, and takes us all the way to the end of time, the day of Christ Jesus, for the purpose of being brought to faith. That purpose is to glorify and magnify God. So in, what, uh, eight verses, you know, in eight verses, Paul, Paul takes us from the beginning of our life as a Christian to the ultimate end of our life as a Christian. Kind of a, an amazing sweep, um, sweep of time there in the Thanksgiving. Okay, this would be another good place to ask any questions you might have about verses 3 through 11. As we get ready to, um, we'll close today by looking at these three discussion questions. Actually, we're only going to look at two because we already talked about number 15. We talked about 15 at length last week. Um, the Apostle Paul thinks about who are his who are his partners in the gospel, and we talked about well, who are our partners in the gospel, and uh, we think especially about first and foremost about or maybe our family are our partners in the gospel, the way that they help us stay in the faith, the way that they encourage us to stay in the faith. We have a responsibility to encourage especially those with whom we live to stay in the one true Christian faith. Um, we, we, our partners in the gospel are our friends and family in the church, you know, our congregation, our partners in the gospel as we seek to accomplish together what we could never do apart, right? Um, our people in the synod together, we walk together as a synod, there are our partners in the gospel. So you and I aren't able to go to Africa to proclaim the gospel, but we are able to be a part of a church body that sends somebody in our name to go share the gospel in Africa or in India. Or you and I can't, um, you and I can't devote ourselves to training future pastors. We don't have the time or the gifts to do that. And so what we do as a senate is we get together and we identify people that do have the gifts to train future pastors and we give them the time to do it. We call them to do that specific work. So um, there's all kinds of, of examples of partners in the gospel. And then that second follow-up question, following Paul's example, how might you regard these people? Or what, what might you do for these people? Well, first and foremost, notice that what Paul does for them is pray. Right? Um, the way he piles up turns, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. So I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Right? It piles on those all words. Um, so the probably, and I probably say this is the first and most important thing that you can do for as, as partners in the gospel is that we can pray for each other. And boy, isn't that especially true in a time like this when when we're not able to gather together as Christians? I think maybe maybe one of the great blessings that's going to come from this is at least for a time we are going to really appreciate. The, what it means to be able to come together as believers when we're able to do that again. That maybe we've started taking for granted um, that, well, of course we're able to come together as believers. Of course we can come to church every week. Um, you know, that, that's, that's been a given for our entire life. And now we're suddenly put in a situation where that, isn't, that literally isn't allowed. It literally isn't possible. And um, so just how, how much more important it is that when we can't join with each other physically, that we join with each other spiritually in prayer. But then also, um, and we talked about this last week too, but also the way that we support monetarily this work that we do together, whether it's um, giving offerings to church or whether it's the offerings that our church gives to the Synod, right, that allows the Synod to do its work. And there's a portion of every dollar that's given to Bethlehem that is that we turn around and give to Senate. So um, that that way of supporting each other, not just in prayer, but in tangible ways, ways of showing Christian love. Um, and one of the examples of doing that, the way that the Philippians did that for the Apostle Paul, 
during its first Roman imprisonment as to the gift of money. Okay, so let's move on to chapter 16. The Christian faith is more than emotion. We kind of talked about that, though there is no doubt that our faith touches and affects our emotions. Where do we find the knowledge that creates, empowers, informs, and directs the Christian life? Um, and hopefully the answer to this question is obvious. Um, but where we find that is in the Word of God. Right? Faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the Word of Christ. Um, or your, um, Psalm 119.105, Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Right? Or Jesus, John 17, 17, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Right? Um, or a sermon on the mount. Whoever hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the man who builds his house on a rock. The winds and the waves beat against that house, but it would not fall. Right? Um, that we, what we hear and we obey God's word. And this is why Lutherans have always been the, a people of the word. It's why one of the three great solas of the Reformation is sola scriptura, right? Um, sola gratia, we're saved by grace alone. Sola fide, through faith alone. And then sola scriptura, uh, and we, the only way that we get God's grace and that we are able to cling to his grace through faith is through the message of the scriptures. So without trying to beat a dead horse, just uh, um, that these opening verses of Philippians are a powerful reminder to us of the centrality, the central place of God's word in the Christian life. That if God's word isn't at the center of the Christian's life, then nothing else is going to be right. Everything else is going to be off kilter. Because the center of the Christian's life is the, is the word of God. Okay? And then number 17 if, when we look at our Christian life, we do not find the love and good works we know ought to be there. All right? Now, if you are someone who says, I look at my Christian life and, yeah, I see all the love and good works that ought to be there. Well, then we need to have a meeting. We need to have a little virtual meeting. Right? <laughs> I, I, think, I think we all would recognize that none of us is able to live up to what we would like to be. And none of us is able to live the kind of sanctified Christian life that we would like. Um, and that we, sh we should never really realistically expect that we will. Think about Romans chapter 7. Where the Apostle Paul says, The evil that I would not do, this I keep on doing, and the good that I would do, I do not do. Okay? Um, that there's always going to be this struggle between our old self and our new self. Between our sinful nature and our Christian nature. And that at least on this side of heaven, um, our sinful nature is never going to completely give up. It's never going to completely, um, we're never going to completely overcome it. And yet, I think that these verses of scripture have a lot to say to us about how we grow in Christian maturity, how we, how we produce more good works. And, but what I think happens a lot of times is that what, what we do, maybe because we're good Americans, is that we, we, we look at ourselves and we say, I'm not producing the fruits of faith that I'd like to produce, so I'm just going to try harder. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, pull up my spiritual bootstraps and I'm going to rededicate myself to doing good works. In other words, we try to place the burden on ourselves. We try to come up with the power to do that from ourselves, from within. And the whole point of this lesson is the power to live a Christian life doesn't come from within. It comes from above. It comes from the word. So if you don't, if, if you look at your life and you don't see the kind of love and good works that you wish you saw there, and again, I think that's probably a universal experience for Christians then the thing to do is not to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and recommit yourself to doing good works. Don't look for strength within yourself. The thing to do is to make God's word more and more the center of your life. And knowing that as you grow in your knowledge and depth of understanding of the word, that the natural consequence will be a greater life of sanctification. It's just like 
um, if I if I feel like my car isn't going the way it's supposed to um, then I don't say to myself well I better turn the ignition on the key and I better turn the, the key harder or I better press down on the gas pedal harder the reality is this if my car doesn't have any gas in it doesn't matter how hard I turn the ignition it doesn't matter how hard I press the gas pedal if the if the gas ha if the car has no gas in it it's not going to go the same thing is true of the Christian life you can try harder you can rededicate yourself to to living a Christian life and that's all good but if you don't have the fuel to make your Christian life go which is the word doesn't matter how hard you try okay um, so it's counterintuitive you might not think you, you might think if you don't if you see if you don't see the kind of Christian love and good works that you'd like to see in your life your immediate thought might be I have to do it I have to be better but according to these words in Philippians um, what God would remind us is no don't look to yourself for the strength for the power for the fuel to do that look to me look to the word for that strength for that power for that fuel the more the word becomes the center of our life the more every other part of our Christian life will naturally naturally fall into place and to the degree that the God's word is not the central part of our life we will experience heartache and frustration that the rest of our Christian life isn't where it's supposed to be it all flows from the word it all flows from sola scriptura and then I just have some suggestions for um, for you if you want to think about you know some things to do during this week so take time to consider the good work that ha God has begun in you so maybe just think about what is my personal story of coming to faith how how has God brought and kept me in the faith and maybe have a special prayer of thanksgiving um, uh, and confidence that God the God same God who brought you to faith will keep you in that true Christian faith um, maybe um, this week you take some time to just re slowly reread verses 1 through 11 and as you're reading you meditate on this connection between knowledge and faith right that if I want my faith to grow then the way that happens is by growing in my understanding and knowledge of God's Word so kind of reread these 11 verses with with that in mind and then maybe the third is the best one um, is to pray for your partners in the gospel think identify who are my partners in the gospel from from those who are very close to me that I maybe interact with on a daily basis to maybe those that are that I've never even met before I've, I may have never met our missionary to Malawi and yet our missionary to Malawi is a partner in the gospel with me so to think about exactly who are all my partners in the gospel and how can I pray for them how can I thank them um, how can I express love and support for them I think if that were all you were to do this week, you'd have plenty of good work to do, to think about and pray for your partners in the gospel. All right, so I thank you for joining us this uh, this evening, or if you're watching this at a time of your convenience, for joining us um, for this the rest of this uh, first lesson in Philippians. What we're going to pick up next time is Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, and this gets into one of the really famous parts of the letter of the Philippians, um, so we'll have the kind of the, the idea to wrestle the, the opportunity to wrestle with that. So hope you can join us again next week. Um, the next live stream event that we'll have on our at our Facebook page will be Saturday morning um, at eight o'clock. We'll continue our celebration our, our, our study of the letter to the Hebrews. The next streamed worship service that we have scheduled on our Facebook page will be Sunday morning at 9.15 as we celebrate the fifth Sunday in Lent. Um, so just kind of mark those things on your calendar and hope you can join us for them. Um, let's close with a blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us always. Amen. Thank you. Hope to see you again soon and God's blessings.